Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Objective. And today is everybody's favorite day of the week, Philosophy Friday. And uh, previously, we discussed uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher. And today we're going to be talking about Nietzsche's relationship, so to speak, with Ayn Rand, uh, influences on Rand, similarities and differences and stuff like that. And I'm here with uh, everybody's favorite co-host, Dr. Jason Rines. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be cool. back. Awesome. So um, last time uh, we entered the conversation, I had the impression, wh when we entered the conversation, my impression was that Nietzsche was sort of like, he was saying like to hell with the modern world, it's for weak people, we should go back to the hillside and live like shepherds. But talking to you, I, I left with the impression that no, at time, first of all, often Nietzsche is being tongue in cheek and often being playful and it's he's not always being literal. But mainly I, my impression is Nietzsche was saying we need a new philosophy, a new ethics that is suitable to the supermen, which are going to come about um, in this modern world of ours. Did I understand correctly? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more like the latter. Um, I think it's it's the supermen will have a morality that supersedes um, current morality and will move beyond it and, and will be suitable to them. Um, I think Nietzsche thinks that, um, uh, that modern European philosophy is um, symptomatic of slave morality from almost 2000 years of Christianity. Um, and, but I think that he, he sees, but possibly, you know, sort of the beginnings of light on the horizon of a new kind of man, something that will transcend man, even, um, that will bring something beyond it. Yeah, um, that, that's true. Um, mm -hmm. And Nietzsche's uh, challenging of, of what he calls slave morality is more or less um, the celebration, the elevation of weakness, like Jesus being tortured and killed is like seen as the moral ideal, like he's sacrificing himself. Uh, that's obviously normally celebrated due to Christianity. And Nietzsche is saying to hell with that strength and greatness is the proper moral way to be. Is that correct? Well, it's I mean, I think that's mostly right, but it's it's complicated. Right. So I think that um, Nietzsche thinks both the master morality and um, that preceded it um, of the, the kind of aristocratic morality. I think he thinks there's more of it's congenial in it. Um, but I think he thinks that the slave morality also was a kind of will to power. I think he also thinks that it has bred in, in a somewhat literal sense, certain improvements in us of self-control um, though on the whole, it's 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 negative and and anti sort of life. Um, but I think that um, but in general, the code of of hatred of strength and the kind of attempt to control those who are stronger by teaching them to hate strength or to, to, by exalting weakness, I, I think he thinks that is, you know, in, in a sense, sort of poisonous and that will be sort of transcended. But also I think he thinks just the, the, the morality of the mob, the, the morality of egalitarianism itself um, and its modern form and sort of European socialism also has to sort of be transcended by people of extraordinary value um, who shouldn't be sort of whose excellence shouldn't be sacrificed for the sort of statistical average or something like that. Um, okay. So yeah, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's tricky just because on the one hand, he's not terribly clear what the morality of the, of the Superman will be. It will transcend good and evil. It'll be beyond good and evil where good and evil is a name for the system of values created by slave morality where good and bad was the system of values in the aristocratic master morality, right? Like health is good, um, uh, unhealth or weakness is bad. Strength is good, weakness is, is bad. Power is good, powerlessness is bad. 
being in control is good, being enslaved is bad. Um, and then the good evil kind of, this is wicked, this is right. And then this is going to transcend that. And it's not entirely clear exactly what it'll look like, but it will be a kind of self-actualization for a higher sort of being. Um, and it will, um, and it won't sacrifice them to that which is less than they are. Um, it, will it sacrifice the lesser to the Superman? That's maybe, quite probably in some respects, but not, you know, that's not maybe the emphasis. Does Nietzsche think that um, like altruism or Christian morality, uh, slave, mor slave morality is like a cope that like weak slaves came up with this morality because like, oh, like it's immoral for you to be stronger than me and to overpower me. Yeah, so he thinks that the, the at least in the, the European context, that, um, that the priest morality of Judaism, which, you know, was sort of an otherworldly thing and emphasized sort of certain kinds of purity, but not kind of force and strength, um, but that was then ad adapted into Christianity by Jesus, but especially by St. Paul. And that in a way, it was harnessed as a form of revenge against the Roman Empire, as a kind of revenge against the boot, the Roman boot uh, on the throat of the downtrodden for centuries. And, it, and as a way of kind of poisoning the well for them. So it was like, yeah, we'll never overpower you, but we can make power something you feel bad about. We'll never have the money you have, but we can make money something you feel bad about. And, by, and in that process, through guilt, the kind of witch doctor type, the, 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 the priest type, the, the, uh, the priest, you know, can kind of control those uh, aristocrats, you know, through guilt. So it is a kind of um, resentment, a resentment that kind of festers until it finally forms Christianity as this sort of virulent poison and against the overseers. And, and, and I think he thinks it's just continued to sort of fester in various ways. Um, mm -hmm. Now, now uh, I've heard it said that a young Ayn Rand once said that uh, thus spoke Zarathustra is her like personal Bible. Do, are you familiar with her saying that? Was it an interview? Yeah, was she, it her, her, she did. Her... So in, um, it was a, um, it was a document called the Candid Camera of Ayn Rand. Um, it's, for, it's a, it's a two page document. It doesn't have an exact date, but it's probably 1935, 1936. Um, and it was probably, um, solicited in part of the, um, in part of the materials to advertise We the Living as like a kind of author's biographical sketch. And let me quote what she says about sort of, uh, there, um, She's, she wrote, um, let's see. Um, favorite philosopher, Nietzsche, his thus spoke Zarathustra is my Bible. I can never commit suicide while I have it. So this is around 1935, 1936. So, um, so she's about 29 at the time. So this is also around the time uh, no, actually, this is, um, this is, yeah, this is around the time that she's also working on um, moral foundation individualism, though already in that you can see um, certain breaks between her and Nietzsche. Um, it's a few years after um, her work preparing a novel called, that would have been called Little Street, uh, which is sort of her most Nietzschean work. Um, by the time you get to the Fountainhead, a few years later, um, eight, nine years later, she's much, she's even cooler to Nietzsche. Um, but at this point, she still at least seems in certain um, moments pretty, pretty keen on, on him. Is it true that early manuscripts of the Fountainhead were more Nietzschean and, and in writing, in revising the Fountainhead, Rand sorted out her differences with Nietzsche, or is that me sort of uh, casting a narrative that may be based on little bits and pieces I picked up? So um, I would refer you to 
um, introduction in um, Robert Mayhew's Companion to the Fountainhead, as well as Shoshana Milgram's essay in that. They both have um, some good material on how she was editing the Fountainhead. Originally, the Fountainhead was going to have an insipid uh, quoting Nietzsche. She got rid of it before it came out. She then in a later, I think the 25th anniversary edition, um, restored it, which is the, the quote, the noble soul has reverence for itself. Um, certainly some of the earlier characters might have suggested more of any chain, um, characters who didn't make it in like Vested Dunning um, might have suggested some of that, but Wynand really represents, I think, the difference between Rourke and Wynand in many ways represents her biggest departure from Nietzsche. And by the end of her writing The Fountainhead, Isabella Patterson is writing her, you know, in a letter, but like, I think you still don't see just how different you are from Nietzsche and how different work is from, you know, Zarathustra or from the Ubermensch. Um, there are differences between the 1936 edition of We the Living and the later edition that came out in, I believe, 59. Um, in particular, there's, there's a quote where um, Andre, asks Kira whether we can sacrifice the many for the sake of the few. And Kira says, you can, you must, when those few are the best. Deny the best, it's right to the top, and you have no best left. What are your masses but mud to be ground underfoot, fuel to be burned for those who deserve it? And you can't imagine Rand Post sort of fountainhead writing anything like that. And indeed she did remove that from the book in the later editions, but that was, you know, a, a, an original kind of idea. Others have pointed to a passage of like Kira's Viking and, um, and, and other things like that. So, um, so the Morney Chan stuff never made it into the Fountainhead. Um, some of it you can find in the 1936 edition of We the Living that she revised and changed. Was, was that Kira who said, who was talking that's about? That's Kira. That's pretty amazing that Rand would ever uh, think that, especially coming from a dictatorship, yeah. having seen what she'd seen. So, wow, I guess Rand really is human. I mean, it blows my mind that like she's in her 30s, you know, after We the Living. Um, it, it blows my mind that she ever wasn't, you know, mature and fully, fully, uh, you know, hadn't fully worked out her philosophy. Yeah. Um, so here's 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 something she writes in 1934 in her notes for the moral basis of individualism, uh, or moral foundation for individualism. Um, uh, the new, I hope, conception of the state, which I want to defend, is the state as a means, not an end, a means for the convenience of the higher type of man. The state, not as a slave of the great numbers, but precisely the contrary, is the individual's defense against great numbers to free man from the tyranny of numbers. The fault of liberal democracies giving full rights to quantity, majorities, they forget the rights of quality, which are much higher rights, prove that differences of quality not only do exist inexorably, but should exist. Um, the next step, democracy of superiors only. Um, that's not, at all how she would put it. In fact, in 1964, I believe, in an, in, in an interview, or could be a little bit later, um, she's asked about, there's an interview of some of her you know, students, followers, about what she says about her treatment of superior people like Rourke or Reardon. And here's what she says. So this is now 30 years later, right? It's an equivocation on the word superior. This is that our Howard Rourke and Reardon, like how, her treatment of superior individuals is similar or different to Nietzsche's of superior peoples. And she says, it's an equivocation on the word superior if you mean superior in the sense of excellence and superior is a bad word to use here. If you mean that some men excel are better than others by means of self-developed self-made virtue, that is a different thing entirely than Nietzsche's concept which, is, which divided men in effect into two species. You see the word superior is more applicable to Nietzsche's philosophy. It is a word which we never use. I never describe my characters as superior men. I describe them as ideal men. Now in Nietzsche's concept, a man is superior or inferior by birth. It has nothing to do with morality. And then later when she's asked, well, 
what does she think about Nietzsche's idea of a different kind of morality applies or different rules apply to superior men? She's very clear, like, no, all men have the same, we all belong to the same species, the same moral um, rules, or the same moral conditions govern us all because we have the same nature um, and, and so on. So I think um, the, she's, you could see, you know, there's a kind of Mencken esque or a kind of Ortega y Gassad or Nietzschean kind of idea in that earlier one of like quality, but this idea that we need to protect um, excellence from the, from kind of democratic abuse, but she really puts it in terms of the rights of quality. And none of her rights in her later thought are sort of defined by and belong to an individual and in rights of being of a certain exceptional nature. Um, it's just that certain rights protect all human beings, which allow any of them to use their, their reason. Um, so, so those are, so you can see some real difference, but it's, and by the way, I'm using some of these quotes that have been gathered by Lester Hunt in his essay in, um, in the Blackwell Companion to Ayn Rand, his essay, Ayn Rand's Evolving View of Nietzsche, which is a very useful, and it's short, very readable, um, summary of, of Rand's changing views on Nietzsche. Um, and he's assembled some of the most important material. Um, it's worth pointing out that even by the time that she's still saying some of these striking things, which, you know, which we're saying is like really shocking, she is already breaking with Nietzsche at least in two important ways, which is she's more and more clear that she's an advocate of reason first. Um, whereas Nietzsche is always at least partially a rationalist. Um, he starts out in his philosophy sort of more solidly a rationalist. His view shifts a little bit, but he's always at least partially a rationalist. Reason is never the kind of principal value to him that it is for Rand. And secondly, she's in, she's, she defends most, uh, most of the time, at least, um, free will, where Nietzsche is a determinist. And it's very clear that his sort of different ethos is belong to different men in, in part by virtue of, of their genealogy, um, not choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in The Fountainhead, I recall uh, Gail Winand saying something like, um, like there's, it's been said that, you know, the work, like five men have like gotten us here, like, like looking at the skyline or something like that. Like, I don't know, maybe he's referring to like five inventors or, you know, so let's say the inventor of fire, Aristotle, and, you know, like three more people. So that, that quote comes to mind and it left me with the impression that this was Rand uh, sort of speaking like this is not the bad side of wine. And this is more like um, like a recognition that, yes, some people are the atlases, so to speak. And obviously, Atlas Shrugged really uh, um, uh, highlights this. Um, so so Rand uh, definitely sees that some people are exceptionally talented and make exceptional effort and that other people benefit um, but that's not the same as saying that those people should rule uh, dictatorially in any way. Yeah, so let, let, me, let me frame this. So before, Lester frames Rand sort of with regard to Nietzsche in sort of three periods. There's sort of like the pre-Fountainhead period. There's like the Fountainhead through Atlas Shrugged period, and then there's the post-Atlas Shrugged period. And in the pre-Fountainhead period, that's where you find more sort of pro-Nietzschean stuff, that's where you find Rand writing in a style that sounds more like Nietzsche in certain places, saying these things like, you know, Zarathustra is her favorite book. Um, the, the, but even in, in that period, you can start to see some differences in their philosophy. In, in the fount, by the time of the Fountainhead, she breaks with Nietzsche and between the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, she's developing both more of her political philosophy, but also more of her fun, fundamentals or epistemology and metaphysics. And it makes her get further and further away from Nietzsche. And once she really develops her explicit ethics, and um, it's very clear how her view is very different from Nietzsche's. Um, then post Atlas Shrugged, when she's writing nonfiction, she starts to talk about Nietzsche again, but always in negative terms, always very much like I am not Nietzsche. My philosophy is the antithesis of his. And then she elaborates on it. And I mention this because um, in one thing that she did always, even in that later period, always sort of give Nietzsche credit for, at least in her own development, was she said that Nietzsche had shown her that she didn't need to kind of look to all of mankind to sort of validate or defend human nature. 
that she didn't need an effect to have like an original virtue kind of determinism or something like that. It didn't matter if the majority of men were scared and weak and un unexceptional and not passionate valuers. As long as there was some exceptional ideal type, that was all that was necessary to kind of validate, to kind of show that there was something worthwhile in the species, so to speak, and in human nature. And I mean, she says that's what she took away from Nietzsche. It's not necessarily what Nietzsche is saying, but, um, but that kind of view of the exceptional individual and how much they add, that I think always stuck with her. And you can see that in the Fountainhead and in Atlas Shrugged and, and so on. Yeah, now a common uh, argument people make against Rand's philosophy, and I heard this as recently as my recent talk with uh, Sargon of Akkad here on the network was that, you know, maybe the objectivists and smart people uh, can, can handle a philosophy like objectivism, but the average working class, average Joe, it's just beyond his capacity. So I think there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, there's a lot of er errors in, in that in that um, claim. But um, yeah, I don't know, like uh, it, it, it comes to mind. Um, now, so yeah, so, so, so to Ayn Rand, um, it's um, it's not her philosophy is not only for the um, exceptionally um, talented. It's just that everyone within their own context uh, can be as rational as as, you know, they, they can be perfectly rational, perfectly uh, focused, perfectly selfish in the rational way. And um, so th this view that like there's a hierarchy of people, like an intrinsic hierarchy, is that what objectivists would call intrinsicism, like that some people are just. Uh, like intrinsically superior to others and uh, but go ahead you had a thought no, take I mean, it away you could mm -hmm. just as much intrinsically hold everybody as equal all the way down like in every way just as mm -hmm. a kind of article of faith or something um i was going to say that so if you look at little street which is her most sort of anti-plebeian kind of thing and most nichean in this respect anti-mob um, kind of way. She's 23 years old, it's 1928. She is in LA at this point, hasn't been in the United States very long, only less than two years maybe, um, or two years. Um, and over time, her view about even the masses, so to speak, shifts. And in particular, her time spent in America with Americans and their sense of life, at least Americans in the 1930s, let's say. Um, improved her, her sense of what, you know, the average person was like compared to the Soviet Union and pre-Soviet Russia. Um, so that by the time of the Fountainhead, um, she, you have characters like Mike and, or in Atlas Shrug, like, like Eddie Willers and Cheryl Taggart, um, people who are not of exceptional ability, um, but who are exceptionally honest and decent and, and, who the main characters who are exceptional both morally and intellectually um, fully respect and enjoy. Um, and so I think that shows her shifting view of the common man, so to speak. The more clear she got about the nature of ethics, the fundamental choice, I think the more, and then that, you know, that, and that it is a choice, um, though I think she always believed in free will, um, the, the more clear it became to her that everyone faces the same choice and you can be honest or dishonest, you can be a valuer or not, um, you can do your best, strive to know reality or not, um, regardless of um, your overall capabilities, how far you can get. Um, the morality is not something that only, that only the... Um, the great can achieve. If it were, it wouldn't be the moral code for everybody. And I suppose somebody could say, yeah, this is why this moral code doesn't apply to everybody. Other people can't do it, but there's nothing in her morality that says you have to be um, a genius or that you have to, it's just, you have to do your best. Um, or, or I should say that you have to do your best. Um, the best way to live your life is to do your best um, is, is probably a better way to put it. It, it is a better way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't, I don't really buy, I don't really buy that, that notion that, and I know she wouldn't buy that notion that 
um, this morality somehow can't be lived or can't be understood by the average person. I mean, look, the average person doesn't necessarily doesn't have to necessarily understand the nuances of her meta ethics. They don't have to understand, you know, her argument about the concept of value arising from the life death alternative and the immortal robot. No, they don't have to understand that. But I mean, but but they can understand, you know, that this is your life. Choose things that'll make, you know, help you live it, that'll be healthy and help you be happy and productive, you know, and and have a purpose. I think people can understand that. And um uh and you know what I mean, like what is it is it really easier for them to understand the Trinity? You know, is it really easier for them to understand merging with all and nothingness and nirvana? I mean, like what what's the alternative? Sure. And it, and I mean, I would add like it's it's very possible, at least in my mind, that a lot of people who seem pretty dim witted today might have not been that way with another education or with another culture. So sure. there's, there's a lot there's a lot left to be seen uh, when a better philosophy takes hold. Christopher in the chat asks if you meant to say mediocre street. I think when you said little street, is it? No, little street. Little, OK, was that in the early Ayn Rand collection? Yeah, you, know? you can find I think you can find the notes for that. Yeah, it's 1928. Uh, or 29 and um, it was notes for a novel uh it's very controversial it has a lot of very nietzschean ideas in it um the main character is the hero is a murderer um and um there's been all kinds of articles on slate about how there was this serial killer who at first she had a good view of later didn't but you know and then and then that influenced her dis- depiction of this character and you know that that typical kind of muckraking stuff, but um, but yeah, no, there's stuff in it that's rather disturbing. But um, you know, she never published it, and her views changed. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty. So, I mean, shocking. she was 23, so you know, think about the dumbest thing you thought about when you were 20. Oh, <laughs> believe me, uh, I understand. But it, it, it's still shocking, you know, as, as you know, from the perspective of someone who is so who's looked up to Ayn Rand, uh, in, for so long to to imagine that at one point she could say something that would be so. Uh, so different from what she later, uh, you know, uh, endorsed. Um, but also a lot of it's artistic, not necessarily meant to be, uh, you know, a, a like in her explicit philosophy. Um, I mean, look, I think we have to bear in mind that, um, you know, look, Aristotle by certain accounts started out a Platonist. Um, and, uh, and particularly for people who come up with their own philosophy. First of all, I mean, everybody starts somewhere and you're reading certain things and some things are better than others. You're attracted to it. And over time, you may find out that the things that you're attracted about it are not what's essential to it as you develop other thoughts. I don't think there's anything sort of weird or surprising in that, but I do think it's, it's you know, we should evaluate what the, both we should evaluate what the, tra- what the developmental trajectory looked like over time, A, and B, we should, we should look to the end, right? We should see where did it end up? And, um, and I think in both respects, it's a pretty favorable development, more and more away from the parts of Nietzsche's philosophy that are really bad, and, and in particular, and clearer and cr- clearer positive view of her own, which allows you to see, which allowed her to have a clear understanding of what she did think was bad about it. So, I mean, that's, that's what I'd point to. But yeah, no, I mean, like, um, nobody, anybody, Howard Work didn't start out able to build his best buildings. You know, Aristotle didn't start out with logic or biology or or his metaphysics. I mean, like everybody, you know, you, you have to develop over time. Yeah, I, but I have unreasonable expectations sometimes. So that's on me. Um, it's hard. I mean, you know, they say never it's, meet your look, heroes, you know, it's never surprising. read your young, your heroes young, I would say. Yeah, no, well, it's surprising. Some of it's shocking. I mean, to to her credit, a lot of this stuff she didn't publish. And then the stuff from We the Living that she did publish, she, when she had the opportunity, she changed, she revised. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, Ayn Rand does, is not, you know, the kind of person to ever withdraw something out of moral cowardice. She was basically she was saying, I changed my mind, right? Like this was wrong. So. Okay. One more question about Ayn Rand revising, and then we, we can talk about uh, how her philosophy relate, you know, it differs and, and bears similarity to Nietzsche's. Um, I, I think I heard it said on Leonard Peikoff's podcast once that like 
that Rand, if she could go back, she would have omitted the religious language from the Fountainhead because of the way that religious people took it as a certain, like the wrong way. But it, have you, are you at all familiar with, with what I'm remembering? The look on your face says no. So we can just bookmark that or I can look it up later. And because uh, I remember hearing Peekoff say that, I, I remember being uh, upsetting, but maybe I misunderstood him. No, I don't, I don't recall ever hearing that. And mm -hmm. it strikes me as odd because there's a specific plot point that revolves around that when Rourke is working on the temple and the man who hires him to do it, basically coached by Tui, says, you know, I know in your own sort of way, you're a very religious man, but he couches it in a certain way. And, and I think it, it, it makes it clear that Rourke is not religious in the conventional sense, but he does have certain values, spiritual values that he reveres. Um, and I think that in itself is sort of, it would be, it would be weird. You'd have to take out that plot point, which is of course a major, it's a major plot point um, in the story and in the evolution of work sort of career. And, um, and, 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 so I don't, yeah, it strikes I must, me as- Yeah, I, I, I almost want to like strike that from the record. I, I definitely don't want to misquote Peek off, let alone misquote Rand. So I'm, I could, I'll, I'll mean, have to I go back and wrong. look at it. Maybe she did. Maybe she found, thought of a better way to put that. Um, but I don't, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe she thought that there were words, maybe, you know, Rand by the time of Atlas Shrugged thought there were words that could express a kind of reverence for value without any association to domains of faith that mm -hmm. religion is taken to have. I don't, I don't know. That's the bet. That, that's my best guess about what mm -hmm. could be going on there. If that's, if that's true, if that's what happened, but it just strikes me that the whole, that whole plot point kind of revolves around the, the way in which it's not that Rourke is comfortable with being called religious, but it's there's a certain way of talking about reverence. And, and so, you know, the novel kind of explains itself on that point. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, the, the religious language or the religious aspect is, is important uh, the way I see it, because it that needs to be addressed if we're going to have a new atheistic philosophy and approach to life. We need to cover that those feelings and that, that experience you get from religion. Like, how does that all relate the way yeah, I, but it's, I it's it. worth pointing out that, um, that religion is never the primary antagonist intellectually in her novels or in, in her mature novels at all. Um, she did at various times try to work in like a priest character, um, but she just found it never really fit. And, and it's much more the modern collectivist version of of mysticism and skepticism that uh, and anti-life that she's that she's uh, approaching and dealing with Galt does have plenty of things to say about the mystics of spirit in his speech but that's and it's um but it's you know anti uh, theism is never like the primary target that she's attacking in, in these in these books um, mm. you know yeah. if she were writing today maybe it would be a because it's more of a kind of threat again to um, to civilized existence. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I debated Mark on this channel once, uh, sort of playfully, but we had an official debate, uh, formal debate about like which is worse, religion or skepticism, and it it, it sort of becomes like a chicken versus egg uh, argument in a certain way. But um, should we should we move it? Uh, let, let, let's move it back to Nietzsche and maybe a bookmark religion uh, for a later date. Um, is there any any similarity like is at once Rand is fully mature, does her philosophy have maybe something in common with Nietzsche's ethics? It may be in a negative sense. They both reject altruism. Is that is that maybe in the closest negative thing? Sense, yeah. So Nietzsche, Nietzsche, I think, as Nietzsche sees it, his most important contribution philosophically has been the reevaluation of all values, which is to say he's sort of stepped outside the altruistic morality, the slave morality looked at it historically in its origins and critiqued it and rejected it. So he's able to say like, this is, this is a system of good and evil. And I am saying this system of good and evil is to be rejected, right? Or is not good. Um, and 
And so in that sense, not working from within the assumptions of an altruistic morality, which almost everybody works within the assumptions of, and then tinkers with what morality looks like in it, but just stepping outside of it and just saying no to that altruistic system, that is something that they have in common. And it's worth saying that's an enormous thing because nearly every single moral philosopher does exactly that. They just take it for granted, some of the key assumptions of the slave morality or of altruism, and then they go from there. Um, others had critiqued Christianity in various ways, had critiqued religious faith besides Nietzsche, though Rand and Nietzsche do have this in common, and, but, and focusing more on the, what's wrong about its ethics was sort of more distinctive of them because other people sort of accepted an altruistic sort of ethics um, or sacrificial sort of ethics, even if they didn't accept the religion or didn't accept religious foundations for their morality. So negatively speaking, they have this in common. They also have in common a kind of reverence for the ideal. Their particular picture of what the ideal man looks like is different, um, substantially so. Um, but both sort of, in a way, both have an ethics that wants us to sort of focus our attention on the ideal. So we're not sort of saying like, what can we do to like elevate the well-being of the worst off? But, but it's worth pointing out that Rand, as we've said already, Rand's view is not sort of like, how can we make the best off best off? And like, how can they sacrifice the lesser for them? It's not that at all. Um, but there is a certain emphasis on sort of the ideal. And um, what else? Um, I think that, um, I mean, those are the main things and, and, they're, and they're big and they're important. But Nietzsche at the end of the day does not reject the notion that codes of value will be built on sort of power relationships. Uh, where Rand wants us to have, you know, a traitor principle of justice. She wants relations of, of man to not be relations of, of power over one another. Um, and I think Nietzsche thinks that, well, they always will be. And, you know, but that's okay. Um, but some of them are weak and, you know, like the power, the weaker has over the stronger through guilt or something like that. Um, so so that, that's an important mm -hmm. Yeah, Nietzsche has some really pretty uh, passages that I've been reading about how like uh, you should be, like be like gold, like just shine. And like that's the way you're spreading your wealth or spreading positivity, not not through charity, but just kind of by by shining so bright that other people benefit and that you should like help um, maybe the lesser people, but not out of a sense of uh, pity, but just kind of, like not because they need it or not because you feel bad for them, but just like the way he puts it is more like just because like that's how great you are. Like a lot of like counterintuitive things. I love his arguments. I, I find myself then in my mind doing similar things like you might think A, but no, it's it's actually B because of uh, that's how like that's how cool you are. You're actually you're such a nonconformist. You're going to conform because, you know, like the, the South yeah. Park joke. Yeah. 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 The, the goths. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. so um, the the um, yeah, there's a similar kind of line of thought in Aristotle when he talks about um, the, 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 the moral man in book, accounts of friendship, in, books not, in book nine, but also when he's talking about pride, the megalopsuchia of a great souled man. And there's a sort of sense of, of wherever, like for the superior person or the greater person, like it's, it's just like, sure, like why would you be stingy with giving stuff to those less than you, you just have so much to give. And it's not because you pity them or something like that. It's just like, it's, it's just the effulgence of your own value, um, the overflowing, so to speak. And you kind of, and, and to not do that would be to like hold your, hide your light and you don't wanna hide your light. So you just, you know, you let it shine and it's an affirmation of your value. And there's sometimes certain things in, in, in Rand that sort of echo that. Um, in, when it comes to certain kinds of beneficence, um, though it's not all of that. Um, now, when it comes to politics, which is obviously a derivative branch of philosophy, um, do we know much about Nietzsche? Did, was he kind of a, like a might makes right person when it comes to politics or? or? Um, it's not my 
this isn't my area of expertise. Um, and he's not primarily in a political philosopher. He is a critic of socialism in Europe uh, at the time, the late 19th century, um, and of sort of certain democratic ideals. Um, he sometimes says positive things about people who were conquerors, um, like, um, but I don't know that he had a kind of positive picture of what he thought a government should look like. Um, I don't think that there's nothing in Nietzsche that's like a traitor principle. There's nothing in Nietzsche like a theory of universal rights. I don't think he could he could embrace a kind of notion of universal rights, or at least Rand thinks he can't in as much as she thinks that for Nietzsche, people are just two species almost. And, and at least later Rand, not that 1934 thing, but beyond that, it, her, her insistence is we have one human nature and there are certain rights that follow from that for everybody. Um, and those rights are sufficient to protect those who will create, um, to, uh, to allow them to create. Um, but it's not like they have a distinct right against those who, who won't be creative or something. Mm -hmm. uh, Nietzsche uh, himself is an artist, but uh, do, does, does he have a view of aesthetics or any kind of theory of art? Well, he has a theory of, he had a theory of tragedy in his earliest work, um, but he doesn't entirely stand by that work. In fact, well, he in his later writings, he rejects that work as the result of a kind of immature Wagnerianism, which he excoriates. Um, his like later introduction to the birth of tragedy is basically like, this work is, ri is ridiculous, his own work. Um, but he did have a certain kind of theory about where tragedy comes from, certain artistic depictions. He has a certain view about becoming an artist of living about Kind of creating those fictions that allow us to live a life that we can embrace and endorse to so some of the stuff in the gay science and, and elsewhere. So he has some aesthetic ideas and he does, I think, think of artists as if Rand often seems to kind of line up with like the producer as the ideal image of her highest kind of man and, and even more a scientist producer kind of thing. Nietzsche, I think, tends to um, tends to uh, gravitate towards the artist um, because the artist creates a kind of new vow, a new system almost of valuing in their artwork. The best kind of artist not only kind of creates an image that's up to certain standards, but makes the standards themselves and in a way that sort of self justifies them. Um, so I think that that's part of Nietzsche's picture. All right, we got, some, we got some super chats. None of them are questions, though. Jonathan, Jonathan again, Allison, Regina, Ken, and Jeff. Thank you all. So no questions, but clearly some appreciation uh, for what we're talking about. I guess uh, let me uh, read this short excerpt here. Uh, it, it really reminded me of like the Randian uh, sort of approach. I'll just jump in here in the middle of this. God is, this is a... Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. God is a supposition, but I want your supposing to be bounded by conceivability. Could you conceive a God? But may the will to truth mean this to you, that everything shall be transformed into the humanly conceivable, the humanly evident, the humanly palpable. You should follow your own senses to the end, and you yourself sh should create what you have hitherto called the world. The world should be formed in your image by your reason, your will, and your love. And truly, it will be to your happiness, you enlightened men. And how should you endure life without this hope, you enlightened men? Neither in the incomprehensible nor in the irrational can you be at home. But to reveal my heart entirely to you, friends, if there were gods, how could I endure not to be a god? Therefore, there are no gods. Okay, maybe that last part is not entirely uh, Randian logic, but a lot actually, of that. Yeah, actually, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Rand at one point sort of said that in her youth, very young, she had a kind of very, you know, rationalistic sort of argument against God, that if there were a God, he'd be better than man, but nothing is better than man. And so there isn't. So um, now maybe she got that from Zarathustra, um, or maybe they just shared a similar thing. Yeah, so it's interesting. So um, both Nietzsche and Rand think that religion creates otherworldly ideals, which are a made up, they're falsehoods, but also that they teach you to like look away from the ideal here. And, and that that's wrong. And um, 
And so there's agreement here between that. And Nietzsche is perhaps drawing off of the kind of Greek notion from Protagoras that man is the measure of all things. And, and, and Protagoras also famously said, I cannot say whether or not the gods are or not. But anyway, um, the, um, the, now the, there are bits there that could be taken in a somewhat more subjective light about creating our own ideal rather than discovering it. But that said, it otherwise sounds like only by using, you know, senses and reason here in this domain can we create a, an ideal which is suitable to human life on earth. And that is a kind of common point. And so that's the kind of passage I think that even more mature Rand can look at Nietzsche and say, yeah, it's one of his better moments. Um, but I think in many instances, you know, Nietzsche is, gonna, is not going to sound that rational um, and is going to make it sound much more like these ideals that we're creating are irrational or irrational, that there, you know, there isn't a truth of the matter. There isn't a, an, an enduring objective metaphysical kind of basis for this, but there's a story that we tell and why not tell it for us, right? So if you're gonna tell a story, tell a story that's good for you. Um, but Rand wouldn't want it to be a story at all or doesn't think it is. Um, but, but yeah, that is one of the passages in Nietzsche that sounds most like an agreement with her mature views. So Ayn Rand recognizes an objective reality and sees reason as, you know, a very uh, objective, you know, uh, method of understanding and living in reality. Um, now for Nietzsche, his, his, both his epistemology as well as his ethics are follow your will. Is that a correct summary? Like just, and which means oh, like your urges or what occurs to you? Go ahead. Um, I mean, your will doesn't, just have to be your urges, I don't think. I don't think. Um, but he is a sort of, he is a determinist. He does think that sort of what we're gonna do stems out of our nature. It's gonna, it's sort of inborn with us. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, it is will insofar as you have certain drives and there isn't sort of more truth or falsehood to one versus another, or some might be more false than others, but even the best ones are not what Ram would call objective. Um, and so, and, and, and so at a deep level, you know, Rand's ethics is all about distinguishing the rational from the irrational, from what is in accordance with reality, which is volitionally adhered to. Um, and what it, you know, what isn't. And, and Nietzsche's it's not. Nietzsche, it's, there are certain kinds of drives for certain kinds of men and some are higher and some are lower and, um, and some are more diluted and some perhaps less, but even the less ones still create or tell a story, which is not strictly objective, which they cling to. I think that's a reasonable way to, to put it. Could you, uh, would it be right to say that to Ayn Rand, uh, your life as a whole is kind of the ultimate uh, standard, which then you're able, you're able to make more, you're able to make rational decisions with that in mind. Whereas someone like Nietzsche, it's much more, everything's much more short term. So in both of them are saying, follow your values, but to I, him, it, it results in an irrational pursuit. No, no, I don't, I don't think for Nietzsche, it's a short term versus long term thing. I don't think Nietzsche's view is one of these short term will worshippers, like whatever you want, in whatever moment. M Nietzsche might say, like, if you can, if ultimately you can affirm all those choices in every moment, then okay. But I think there has to be a kind of long term picture where you can look at your whole life as faded and as faded to happen over and over and over again and then still say yes to it. This is the idea of eternal recurrence. Um, and it may mean that there's a certain narrative and a certain perspective from, from that you have to be able to look at the whole of your life and, and affirm it. So I don't think it's all about just short-term, long-term. Moreover, for Rand, it's, it's not part of the deeper difference between her and Nietzsche and part of how she sees the difference between her and Nietzsche is that it's that though our life is our ultimate value, our human nature is our standard 
of value and that that human nature is common to all human beings. So that's a big part of it there, that there are objective standards and that that objective standard is universal for all human beings, not different for some superior types and inferior versus inferior types. Uh huh. Uh, do you know if Ayn Rand was ever a determinist? As far as I know, she was not. So, mm, I wonder if that's uh, that that was kind of a, a a major reason where she ended up sort of where she ended up intellectually uh, because of that sort of uh, persisting uh, recognition of free will. But um, hard- she says she says in one point that that was something that always was always a point of difference between her and Nietzsche. And um, she also says, um, what did she say? Um, It was, um, well, in any case, that was always, that was always a difference um, between them. And, or at least she says later on that that was always a difference. Um, It's, you know, if you look at some of this early stuff that we've looked at, she's somewhat, she's perhaps still looking at people very qualitatively different, the superior kind or not, but but that doesn't entail that she thinks it's it's innate rather than volitional. I think she probably thought it always was in some way volitional. Um, uh, And, Mm-hmm. There was uh, one part of Zarathustra's serpent that uh, really reminded me of the fountainhead, which is when Nietzsche is describing like the process of, I guess, attaining greatness. He says, like, first you become a camel, you know, going through the desert without the need to drink. And then you become a lion, much more reckless, but much more powerful. And then the final stage, you're expecting it to be like a dragon or a T-Rex, but it's a baby boy looking at the world with a fresh set of eyes, no memories to bog you down and looking at the world and thinking one word, yes. Now, of course, yeah. that reminds me of Rourke, Dominique and Wine and all having dinner together. Yeah, it could also, I mean, it, it's also um, in particular, sometimes, you know, people describe a camel as like an animal made by committee. Like it could be, it could also be a Plato's Republic where the appetites are this many headed creature and then the spirit is a lion, and then um, reason is like a human being, even an image. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, camel and many-headed being—it's it's probably not that. Um, it, it may be just an original kind of thought, but mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, this is fascinating stuff, and uh, I, I, I have a feeling we could grab any paragraph from this whole book and probably have uh, have a conversation about it. There's uh, so yeah, much. I'd love that. I mean. I, I'm not sure if I made it clear enough last time when, when you brought up Zarathustra, but um, but certainly like in Ecce Homo, the, the last thing Nietzsche finished writing before his mental breakdown, which is his sort of autobiography and a review of all his works, he makes it very clear that he thinks of Zarathustra, Zarathustra as his masterpiece. Um, and 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 poetically, it's beautiful. Um, I, I do stand by my characterization of it as really difficult. And often elliptical and difficult and challenging to interpret. Um, but that, but the, the sort of, it's given the pride of place it's often given among Nietzsche's works is I think justifiable at minimum from the fact that Nietzsche places it as his greatest work um, from his own perspective, so. Nice, nice. Okay, well, we got to, wrap it there to make way for the upcoming show in just a few minutes at 7 p.m. UK time. It's Finance Friday with Jim Brown, and he'll be discussing banks and the dollar, the U.S. government's new favorite weapons. And then coming up an hour later at 8 p.m. UK time, it's James Valiant and Robert Nasser. They'll be discussing Leonard Peikoff's essay, Medicine, the Death of a Profession. All right, everybody. Uh, Thank you, Jason. Uh, This was great as always. Um, thank you all everyone for the super chats, please. Everyone consider becoming an Ayn Rand center UK member, uh, to get a- exclusive access to study groups and content and to help support this thing. So we can keep on providing you all with content. So, all right. Thanks, Jason. My pleasure. And goodbye.